Hello and welcome. My name is Taz Kasson and I'm from the Black Dog Institute and we are coming live to you from Stone and Chalk in York Street in Sydney. It's such a pleasure to welcome you to our inaugural research showcase. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first inhabitants of the nation and the traditional custodians of the lands where we live, uh, live learn and work. We pay our respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders past emerging from all nations across the country. And I thought it was incumbent upon us today just to touch on um, the impact that a um, unvaccinated virus has spreading throughout a, a population and reflecting on what that might have been like for our Aboriginal um, uh, brothers and sisters uh, during colonisation. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us for our research showcase today. As you can see, we are uh, in a small, much more pared down version than we were uh, expecting to be a week ago. And I want to commend the team for turning around um, what was a large event to now a very small virtual event. Hello to, and welcome to everybody joining us on YouTube. Uh, we are so grateful to have you. You'll see that um, through um, uh, within YouTube, there's a comment box. I'd love to hear your comments throughout this presentation and feedback, and I want to encourage as many people to jump online and tell us how they're feeling or what they're thinking about uh, with this research showcase. So what is the research showcase? Um, I had a, a long-winded, really scientific explanation as to how to explain it, and I dozed off as I started to read that. <laughs> so instead, we're going to do something a bit different. Um, I am the most least scientific person you will meet. Uh, I, I don't even... The only word I know in scientific language is osmosis, and I don't even know what it means. So... This showcase is putting what we do at Black Dog Institute into, a, into language that me, as the most unscientific person, will be able to understand. We're taking some of our top minds, some of our brightest leaders uh, within Black Dog Institute and Australia and internationally, and lifting the bonnet on what we do in terms of research, which is a cornerstone pillar of our work at Black Dog Institute. We are so thrilled and excited to be able to present these really incredible minds and, and bright people uh, that are gonna take you through the work that they're passionate about and how they got there in their career. So, up first is, well, we'll bring out the big guns up first, people. Let's, get, <laughs> let, let, let's be very honest. Um, up first, we're going to have a broad conversation uh, with two of the leading minds in the mental health landscape, talking about Australia and mental health. Uh, we're going to talk about the role of philanthropy is in funding our work and the importance of um, Black Dog Institute groundbreaking mental health research. So up first, what I would like to do is introduce our, 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 our um, panel discussion for today. Um, First, we have Dr. John Fennelly. Uh, John has a long career as a senior public servant, most recently as the inaugural New South Wales Mental Health Commissioner from 2012 to 2017. Prior to that, John was Deputy President of the Mental Health Review Tribunal, Assistant Director of General at the New South Wales Attorney General's Department, and Deputy Commissioner and Independent Commissioner Against Corruption. And yes, I did have to read that because that is a lot of incredible work that you've done in your career, John. Um, I've had the pleasure of introducing Helen um, numerous times in the last, I guess, few months as we've done um, uh, several events. And I've always talked about her academic accolades and her incredible leadership at Black Dog. But I thought I'd do something a little bit different today, and I asked her, just before we came on, I said, what does scientia professor mean? Because um, it's, it's a um, title that, 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 that she wears very proudly. And um, she tried to dismiss it and say, oh, it's nothing, it doesn't mean anything. So I looked it up, I Googled it, and I think this, and I did that because I think this speaks to who Helen is. And I'm going to read it. Scientia professors are selected not only by, their, by virtue of their excellence and innovation, but also in recognition of their behaviours that can contribute to our community, such as demonstrating collaboration and teamwork, embracing diversity and showing respect for others. And I really think that speaks to who Helen is. Ladies and gentlemen, um, please welcome to our first session, John and Helen. Welcome. Thank you, Taz. I almost went red then, I think, <laughs> hearing that. Thank you very much. That was really... Um very warm introduction to both of us. Mm. Um, and we're really pleased to be here. It's wonderful to have a, a showcase and fantastic, I think, initiative from Black Dog to actually come out to the community and talk directly to funders and others who are interested in our work. Um, I thought uh, we're going to cover a number of different areas today. Um, but I thought I would kick off, John, by talking about... Um, what the state of affairs is with funding from our government for Good mental idea. health at the moment. Um, so uh, 
At the moment, uh, epidemiologists and health scientists generally estimate the burden of disease caused by mental illness to be around 15% of the total burden of health across the world. If we look at the amount of funding that we receive from the National Health and Medical Research Council, which is our primary um, way of getting uh, formal grants from the government, that represents around 8% of the total funding. So um, if I just move across and move the slide forward, I just illustrate this um, in this diagram. So the National Health and Medical Research Council does give around $620 million a year for medical research, of which uh, um, mental health research receives around $58 million. In contrast to that, uh, what we often see is that with such little funding, the actual rank order of excellence of Australian scientists in psychiatry and mental health is, would be commensurate with the amount of funding. However, this is not the case. This is uh, what looks like an abstract painting, um, but the orange line actually indicates the extent of funding, the, the ranking of our scientists in psychiatry and mental health relative to those across the world. Uh, in a number of different areas, including psychiatry and mental health, cancer, oncology, endocrinology, cardiology, and immunology. And as you can see, we are around about four or fifth ranked in the world for our science in psychiatry and mental health. And that rank is lower across the other disciplines that are represented there. So I think it's really important to know that we really punch above our weight when we're talking about um, mental health research in Australia. Of course, the highest in every category, generally speaking, is the US, which uh, ironically is putting so much money into its medical research, which isn't, as we know from the coronavirus, being matched by the capacity of its services to respond. And, and finally, John, I just wanted to show this particular slide from an article that we um, did for uh, the Medical Journal of Australia a few years ago now. Um, but what we did was compare the amount of funding from the National Health and Medical Research Council uh, across a number of causes of death. So skin cancer, falls, vehicle accidents, suicide and self-harm. And as you can see, suicide and self-harm is actually the bottom of the rank there. So the amount of funding that goes to suicide and suicide self-harm is very low relative to these other important uh, conditions. But if you actually look at the mortality or the death rates arising from those different causes, um, suicide by far is the largest cause of death. So I think we have both lack of funding and potential differences in equity of how funding is distributed by the National Health and Medical Research Council. I guess the bottom line to that is that we really need so much support um, from philanthropy in order to be able to compensate and grow that pool mm. of funding. I think that's really why we want to acknowledge our funders, because we wouldn't be able to do the work we're doing today if it wasn't for the fact we get such remarkable support from the funders that we have. And we'd like to broaden that pool if at all possible. Can I say, um, back in 2007, when I became the state's first mental health commissioner, and I should say I'm a lawyer by background, so I'm not a clinician, um, but what I found very quickly in the reform area was the fact that the mental health area is a very noisy and is a very confusing space, just as the recent report um, had shown. Um, and I found that for governments trying to grapple with this area, they're often looking for what they should do. And what they tend to do is to stick with crisis. So whether it's in our clinical system or whether, we, whether it's in relation to research, they tend to go towards crisis, which means that true prevention and early intervention, which is what Black Dog does so well um, from a scientific point of view, often gets missed out in that big funding pool. Um, the thing is that um, when I was going through that process as a lawyer trying to make my way through all of this, what I discovered re relatively earlier on, and I was very pleased about this, was the Black Dog Institute. 
because I was seeing a lot of NGOs and charitable bodies who were involved in various forms of activity in the mental health space. Um, sometimes advocacy based, always well intentioned, but often not guided by very much at all and often having drifted away from their initial purpose. But sitting amongst all of that noise and sometimes not a lot of light uh, was the Black Dog Institute, which was doing you know, hard nosed research where they had a track record for showing they could do the work and therefore as a consequence of that it was really worthwhile um, from, a, from a person who has a, who's not as risk averse to look at investing with Black Dog to make sure that we'd start breaking new ground. And whether we're talking about prevention early intervention in a purely research sense or whether we're talking about um, better forms of clinical activity, there's no doubt that um, Black Dog has really shown that it can do that work very effectively. Yeah, thanks, John. I think um, we do feel that we're leading the way in the sense that we really are very rigorous about being evidence-based and suggesting uh, recommendations and other um, outputs based on real um, rigorous looking at the evidence yep. to inform the way that we move forward. Um, so it's, uh, it's really good to know that that was seen from the outside as well. But That's also, I want to add to that, though, that... Um, yeah, with all of this, anyone who's involved in the mental health space, the most important thing we should never lose sight of is just a lived experience of those people who have experienced mental illness and their families and carers. And that was the other side of Black Dog. It was very close to that. We all know today that particularly when we look at young people, the world is a remarkably uncertain space, you know. Um, compared to, I'm 63, and compared to when I was a teenager, you know, I had job certainty, probably housing certainty, and I probably thought I had environmental certainty. Kids have nothing of that sort today, but now they've got coronavirus, so they're even less uncertain, less certain than they might have been. And can I just say it's so important that we don't lose track of the science in this because we will emerge from the current crisis, but we need to make sure we don't lose pace, that we're actually responding to those needs, whether it's you know, within schools or whether it's in even workplaces. We need to be making sure that we're ready to meet that challenge and to emerge from this stronger than we are now. Yeah, thanks, John. I think we, um, we've sort of been rapidly changing in Black Dog in the last month or so. Um, we've been having stand-up meetings with our executive and other communication staff, uh, our people and culture people. Um, and also we've been putting out, as fast as we can, uh, evidence-based, uh, evidence-informed sort of policy documents, yeah. and we've actually been proactively distributing them to Parliament. And we can only do that because we have the expertise in-house with um, real experts in, in these areas. Yeah. So and I think the government might also emerge from this with a desire to look to the science, to yeah. sort of say, let's, make, let's be guided by science in these matters. Because I mentioned one other thing, I, you may have noticed it this week, that um, as we all look at possible self-isolation and becoming good at working from home, I was really taken by the report on um, Isaac Newton, who in 1965, at the age of 23, took himself into self-isolation, and in that 12-month period, gave us an understanding of gravity, um, <laughs> developed a calculus system, um, and also discovered that light is made up of all colours. And that's in a 12-month period at the age of 23 in isolation. So we can make the most of all of these things. No pressure. Thanks, John, no for pressure. that. Right. <laughs> You're well ahead of well, the curve. Well, peace will be coming <laughs> next. <laughs> but yes, it's an opportunity, isn't it? And yep. trying to make that opportunity. I guess um, I'd like to thank um, people who have funded our research. Mm. Um, uh, I'm just thinking of our lifestyle, lifespan project, which we'll hear about today. Um, I, that simply would not have been possible without uh, a donation from the Paul Ramsey Foundation, which really kick-started something that's expanded across the whole of Australia in terms of the impact of putting evidence-based information out uh, to communities and having them respond to a number of different strategies. And we're very, very grateful for um, the the foundations who do provide funding. We do tend to see that, as you were saying before, there's a lot of interest in prevention and early intervention, uh, young people, uh, because I think that's a concern of our communities. Mm. And, and Lifespan's a great example of, um, of certainly a funder being prepared to look at that and you know, perhaps have a better appetite for risk than others, but also the fact that you know, Black Dog was able to really, in a very scientific and rigorous way, indicate to the potential funder exactly what the program inv would involve, exactly what the milestones would be, 
the fact that it would be evaluated throughout so that the funder knew with confidence that this was something that they could take a risk on. Thank you, John. It's been great to talk to you. Um, really enjoyed that. Yep, um, and thank you, everyone, for listening. We're really pleased to be able to present today some of the research that we're doing now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John and Helen. And what you can't hear is the rapturous applause from everybody on YouTube. <laughs> um, speaking of YouTube, we've already had some great comments um, coming through. And yes, in answer to the questions, the slides will be sent around um, afterwards. And it's great to see that community jumping up on YouTube and, um, and being engaged. OK, up next. Uh, well, next we have um, all of our researchers that we brought together um, coming together to do 10 minutes uh, of specifically about their research project. Now, just bear in mind that most researchers um, public speaking isn't their first uh, choice. And if it, uh, they are scientists by nature, and um, by that very nature, it's probably quite daunting to come and speak in front of a crowd. I'd say more daunting to come and speak in front of a camera. So I am so um, with these researchers who have been working um, on this uh, for quite a bit of time. Up first, I am really, really thrilled, really thrilled um, to welcome Dr. Eliza Werner-Seidler um, as our first presentation today, who'll be talking about pre um, uh, prevention of, adult, of adolescent depression. Um, Aliza uh, completed a PhD at Uni University of New South Wales in 2002. She leads up the Youth and Early Intervention um, Streams at Black Dog, and she is especially looking at prevention and treatment and depression and anxiety in young people, the use of e-health technology to improve the reach and uptake of interventions, and the implementation of school-based intervention programs. Um, Aliza is just a thrill to work with, and um, she, uh, her programs have incredible resonance and real application, especially for my nine-year-old daughter, you know, who is, um, is, is, is feeling anxious about everything that's going on, so this talk is really pertinent. I'm looking forward to hearing it. Please welcome to the stage, Dr. Aliza. <laughs> Thanks, Taz, and thanks, everybody. So why is it that vaccination against physical health conditions like rubella and HPV a standard practice in our schools, but vaccination against mental illness is not? I'm going to tell you about some of the work that I do, and importantly, the Future Proofing Study, which directly addresses this question. When I finished my training in 2012, I finished my PhD and my training as a psychologist and I headed over to Cambridge University. I envisaged spending my time in the beautiful King's College when actually the closest that I got to that was from a rooftop bar nearby. In reality, I ended up working in part at Adam Brooks Hospital in an NHS service that was focused on treating individuals who experienced treatment-resistant depression. What that means is that they've tried two treatments, usually an antidepressant medication and a psychological intervention, and neither of these things have worked. I want to tell you about somebody that I met in this service. Let's call her Valerie. She was in her mid-50s by the time I met her and had experienced depression since adolescence. It took her more than five years on waiting lists for her to access the right treatments, which unfortunately for her had not worked. She'd grown up in Cambridge with access to a great education and health system, yet neither of these things had kept her safe. She trained as an earlyhood child educator, had only ever had the opportunity to work during brief periods when she was well. Her husband left her when she was in her 30s, unable to manage her depression, and her two children had moved to London to, try to work and study. By the time I saw her, she'd experienced more episodes of depression than she could count. She was on a disability pension and had had several suicide attempts. Her life had been entirely defined by her depression and her suffering. My work with her was futile. The skills that I had learned to treat depression did not work in her case. Her thinking was ingrained, rigid and resistant to change, and it left me feeling really frustrated that I had not got to her earlier in life. And she's just one of many. I could tell you about Andrew, the high-functioning banker from London who had bipolar disorder, who'd never told anybody about his manic and depressive episodes until I saw him when he was in his 40s. Or I could tell you about Sandra, a high school teacher who experienced debilitating anxiety, who repeatedly presented to emergency hospital departments thinking she was having a heart attack but actually was having panic attacks. And I could continue. These are the stories 
of your colleagues, your friends, and your families. This whole experience really motivated me to want to make sure that the right interventions got into the people who needed them at the right time, which for most people is during adolescence or young adulthood. My search to work with young people brought me back to Australia and eventually the Black Dog Institute. Initially, I started working with young people clinically at first in the clinic, and I could not believe what I was seeing. The huge amounts of clinical change in just a few sessions working with young people was simply not comparable to what I'd experienced working with older adults in the NHS. Their minds were simply so much more amenable to change. One of the very first people I treated in Australia, I'll never forget her, let's call her Emma, she presented, her mum brought her in at the age of 19 years, two weeks after she dropped out of uni due to her OCD symptoms and concerns about contamination. She really listened to me and with the help of her mum, attending about eight sessions with the two of them, she was able to implement the skills and the strategies that we developed together in therapy into her life. By the time I finished with her, merely two months later, she would do things that even you and I would, would veer away from, like touching toilet bowls and so on. She re-enrolled in uni, and her mum contacted me a year later to let me know that she was still doing well. Of course, I've chosen to share with you as one of the success stories, but believe me, they are so much more ubiquitous when you work with young people and get to young people early in their course of disorder. This also aligns with the research. We know that the earlier you can intervene when people first start experiencing symptoms, the better their outcomes over their entire life. Motivated by this, I decided to combine my clinical experience with my scientific background and find skills to find ways to improve youth mental health, not at an individual scale level, but on a large scale. I wondered what would have happened to Valerie and her life had she been able to access the best interventions back when she was teenager, a teenager without having to wait more than five years to, get, to access the right treatments. The more I looked into it, the more I realised that there's a huge opportunity to intervene early. If we have a look at the prevalence of mental disorders in Australia, and this is data from more than 75,000 Australian households from 2015, we can see that Young people aged 11 to 15 years old have a, have a prevalence level of about 5%, and the most common disorders are depression and anxiety. But then something happens around puberty, because if we have a look at 16 and 17-year-olds, uh, 17 17 that level jumps to about 15%, so that's an increase of almost 200%. And the more recent data paints an even worse picture. It looks like the problems are getting worse, and we're now at the point where we're, we expect one in four young people to experience a mental health disorder by the time that they are 18 years old. The way that I see it is that we have this rising wave of mental illness that our kids are up against, and we simply cannot let them drown. We need to avoid letting them end up in services well into their trajectory as adults. Consider what would happen if there was a way for us to throw a life buoy to every young person before they sink? What if we could deliver prevention programs at scale, which we know work? Something that wasn't prohibitively expensive and could capture the whole spectrum of young people. Well, this is exactly what we're doing in our Future Proofing project. We're going to reach, at a minimum, 10,000 Year 8 students across at least 200 schools and deliver a prevention program before their risk of mental illness significantly increases. How are we going to do this? Well, we're going to be using digital technology, and the time for this has never been more relevant. We're going to be, developing, we're going to be delivering interventions using young people's own smartphones, this is going to let us reach about 95% of the population, and it's economically viable. We're going to be testing whether these apps can prevent depression and anxiety, build resilience, and improve academic outcomes when delivered at scale through the school system. We're going to follow up young people for five years, which is almost unprecedented in these kinds of psychological studies, which tend to follow up young people for six to 12 months at best. And what this is going to do is provide us with unprecedented knowledge of the risk and protective factors and the impact of early intervention. Future proofing is all about addressing mental health in the same way that we address physical health, for which inoculation and vaccination is critical. The challenge for us now is to get to all young people across Australia. Across Australia. So where are we up to now? We have 128 schools who've already registered their interest 
but there are 880 schools in New South Wales and more than 1,500 schools in Australia. We need to get someone from our team at Black Dog into every single school to support the delivery of this important program. What you'll see here in the blue pins are the schools who've already registered for our study, but the orange dots are the schools that we want to get into. We think that every young person should have access to these interventions, regardless of how disadvantaged their school, how small their school, how remotely located it is, or how poor their internet connection might be. And we're committed to reaching these people. We think that they all deserve early intervention, regardless of their risk or circumstance. And again, this is where we need your help. The driving force behind what I do is to make sure that our children access prevention and early intervention when they are young. I don't want to see people like Valerie end up in services after years on waiting lists and treatments that haven't worked for them. Part of young people's general education is their emotional health and resilience, and it's my goal to make sure that schools and communities around the country adopt this approach and create better futures for our kids. What I'd like to see over the next five years are decreases in adolescent mental illness as a direct consequence of using prevention and early intervention programs delivered at scale. Prevention is always better than treatment and cure. It delivers a better return on investment and most importantly, reduces the suffering and the trauma experienced by young people and their families. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Eliza. Thank you so much. That was, that was really fantastic. I think what really um, struck me in that presentation and the work I've done with Eliza is the scale, is the ambition of it, is Australia-wide and, and reaching um, almost every school kid in Australia. It's incredible work, and um, thank you so much for that. Up next, ladies and gentlemen, is Dr Kit Huckvale. Uh, talking about digital phenotyping. Now, if you're like me, I have no idea what digital phenotyping means, but as I started to work with Kit over the last year, this is such a fascinating part of the work that we're doing. Uh, Dr. Huckvale completed his PhD at the Imperial College in London in 2016 before joining Black Dog Institute. And here's something that I find quite extraordinary about a lot of the people who, um, who, who are part of Black Dog is they are multidisciplinary. So um, uh, Kit is an, also a medically trained doctor, an expert in health informatics and mixed methods research and has worked with the Microsoft Research Cambridge, Novartis and the UK Department of Health on translational products, projects in e-mental health and mobile health. Welcome to the stage, Kit. Good morning. Can your smartphone predict mental illness? That's the question that drives my research at Black Dog Institute. Can these sensor-packed devices that we all carry pretty much all the time that are continuously collecting signals about what we do, our behavior, as we move, as we type and we communicate, can they provide a window into the changes in the brain that predict the onset of something like depression or anxiety, where the treatment is working, and what kinds of treatment might work best? This idea is digital phenotyping. And this is early stage research at the intersection of two disciplines, health, specifically mental health, and computer science. My training puts me at that intersection too, I guess. So you can probably hear I'm not from Australia. I trained and worked as a doctor in the UK. Uh, and I can confirm uh, that the rain in the UK doesn't only fall uh, in Cambridgeshire. It's pretty much ubiquitous. And in, as I worked on the wards in practice, I became increasingly frustrated at the state of IT in the UK Health Service. Tools intended to drive clinical value that really only satisfied business administrative needs, nothing really user-centered, no real uh, innovation in care delivery using digital health, and I saw an opportunity to do things better. So I did a postgraduate degree in computer science, and that led to a PhD in mental health. Uh, and a, in digital health, sorry, and a turning point. The insight from my supervisor at the time, when he saw the launch of the iPhone and the App Store, less than 18 months before I started, that this would change everything in terms of how we interact with services, and I think he called that right. Um, but also that the future of digital health would increasingly be in the hands not of clinicians, but of users. 
people living with mental illness, their carers, the public, you and I. And he pointed me towards smartphones, and that really set me on the course uh, I'm on today. And when you look around the world now, well, there has been an explosion in research in digital health using these devices. Um, but I think there are really a few centers that stand out because of their commitment, not only to do the research, but to put it into practice uh, through implementation studies, through education, through policy outreach. And I think Black Dog Institute is actually one of those places, and that's why I made the move to Australia. And going back to where I started, that frustration on the ground Actually, this kind of research really only matters if we can change what happens on that ground. And I think that's what we're trying to do at Black Dog Institute. But why is this an important question for research now? Elisa has talked compellingly about the problem we face in terms of mental illness burden, particularly in young people, when nearly a quarter of young people with, uh, report symptoms consistent with mental illness, being able to identify and intervene early is becoming a priority predicting who might develop illness or who will respond to a particular treatment is potentially important and useful strategy. But there is a second dimension here, which is a big thematic challenge for mental health. We do not have objective tests for mental illness. If you or I walk into an Australian emergency department with unusual chest pain today, likely as not they'll take a blood test, uh, and they'll analyze, amongst other things, the level of a group of proteins called troponins. These are specific to heart cells, and so finding them in the blood indicates damage. This is a highly sensitive test for a heart attack, but it is also highly specific, so specific that even without chest pain, you can also predict whether someone might be at risk of a future heart attack from these kinds of measurements. Well, we don't have anything like that in mental health today, and optimism that things like genetic or even genomic tests or functional imaging would give us those insights, I think hasn't panned out perhaps in the way we hoped a decade ago. And what we need, and what you can see with tests like troponins, is that ability to measure mechanisms. Troponins are part of heart muscle released when it's damaged, so how can we find similar mechanistic connections that can provide signals about what is going on in the brain in mental illness? Well, what about behavior? The way we think and act are so closely coupled that in the last century it drove an entire philosophy of mind focused on behavior. And I think for the first time we have in smartphones and other wearables technologies that can capture and measure fine-grained behavior within individuals so that we can start to explore these questions of the possibility of objective tests for mental illness. And we have clear signals that this connection does exist and can be exploited. For example, research from Denmark showing that you can warn people living with bipolar disorder that they are about to experience relapse simply based on GPS and movement traces captured using the sensors based in their phone. And that really matters because people can step up treatment, potentially avoiding serious complications and relapse, and also because people with that condition can often struggle to recognize the signs of relapse themselves. But also, this process of detection can happen completely automatically, without adding to that burden of living with a complex long-term condition. So this is not just an interesting research question. It is, uh, there are real potential benefits for real people. And our research at Black Dog Institute is exploring this question in three ways. Firstly, by building the technology needed to capture signals from smartphones. Smartphones may be full of sensors, but you need to get that data off securely if you want to do research and power the future of interventions. And one of my projects at Black Dog Institute has built a new platform working with collaborators at Deakin and, and across the Institute, developed over the last 12 months, which allows us to do that at scale, setting the stage for future sensor-based interventions. And secondly, by exploring the attitudes of different groups of people to this technology, recognizing that there are significant privacy and security concerns any time that you're collecting sensor data, but also that this information has value to individuals. So our Living Lab project is all about figuring out not just how we can collect this data, but how should we? By talking to young people who stand to be most affected by these technologies. And third and key, by using this technology to collect signals from large groups of people over time, and then through modeling and machine learning, 
exploring how these signals relate to the mental health issues that some of these people will go on to experience. For example, we are specifically interested in the relationship between cognitive function, mental health symptoms, and passively collected data, even something as simple as typing on your phone. It's becoming clear that the way you type predicts your self-reported mood, and that in turn is coupled to underlying brain function. What we're trying to do is to unpick whether this relates to core cognitive capabilities or something else specific to mental illness, such as changes in emotion regulation. And to do this, we need data. Elisa has talked about the future-proofing study, where we are already collecting signals from young people at the start of adolescence. That project will ultimately collect data from thousands of young Australians over five years. But our long-term vision is to build a digital phenotyping data bank Think like a biobank, but for behavior. The behavioral patterns and, uh, of men and mental health outcomes of thousands of users captured using smartphone sensors. A resource that can accelerate research and new applications in this area, not just by Black Dog Institute, but with other researchers across Australia. Now, digital phenotyping is never going to be as simple as a blood test. Uh, sensor measurements are noisy and highly individual. Think of the disruption that can occur to the rhythms of life. Think of what's happening, what's happening now. And we need to be able to account for that if we're going to make tests that are as sensitive and specific as troponins and as the ones we need. So our future tests will need to integrate information from multiple sensors and multiple sources. And figuring out which sources matter and doing that efficiently is a big thematic challenge for us and our partners. And as I said, we're really at the start of that journey. But I just want you to imagine the potential a digital sensing screening test offered to young people in the same way we offer immunizations that might allow us to take preventative action to avoid the risk of future mental illness. Digital health apps that can use sensor signals to tailor their therapeutic content to maximize the likelihood you'll get benefit. And information returned to patients and clinicians to enable shared decisions that lead to the best outcomes, whether it's picking the right treatment or diagnosing the condition in the first place. So can the sensors in your smartphone predict your risk of mental illness? We think they can, and we're working to find out right now. Thank you. Thank you, Kit. Thank you very much. And there's that word that I, I keep hearing um, throughout Black Dog and throughout these presentations, which is scale. So um, how do we take what we're doing and how do we scale it across Australia and how do we scale it internationally? Such a fascinating topic. Thank you, Kit. Uh, up next, uh, we're really thrilled, really thrilled to welcome Leilani Darwin um, from, this, uh, from Black Dog Institute talking about the Centre of Indigenous Lived Experience. Lived experience is core to our values at, uh, at Black Dog Institute and certainly the voice of Indigenous Australians is an essential component of that. And Leilani is a, is a fierce advocate for um, Indigenous uh, rights and voice within Black Dog Institute and we're thrilled to have her. Um, Leilani Darwin is an Aboriginal woman who has been touched on a personal level many times by suicide and mental illness. Uh, she's a Kwandukuma, Kwandukuma, Kwandamuka, thank you very much. I knew I'd stuff that up. A uh, woman uh, who is, uh, her ancestral home is a beautiful Stradbark Island, and I believe you flew down this morning. Um, yes, so thank you very much for coming in these current times. Um, she's a powerful advocate for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander-led uh, culturally informed practices within mainstream services. Please make Leilani feel welcome. Thank you and good morning. Um, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are all meeting today and pay my respects particularly for the elders. Um, I know that without the path that they have walked well before my time that I wouldn't have ever had the opportunity to stand here today and to share a story which is what I'm going to do. Um, I really wanted to start off with this slide to give some context to the sense of urgency that I have each and every day in the work that I do and why it's so important. And it always um, is a reminder when I attend different conferences and forums that the reality of my life as an Aboriginal person in Australia is that I'm not going to be here as long as the rest of you. That's sobering. And it's a reminder to me every day that I have to do what I can while I am here. Um, I'm more likely than non-Indigenous Australians to die from respiratory disease, mental health problems, cardiovascular disease, 
diabetes and chronic kidney disease, and I've highlighted a couple of which I am, in fact, at an even higher rate for because I'm currently diagnosed with depression and anxiety. I have family history of um, kidney failure, diabetes and lots of things. I'm three times more likely to die than you. I'm eight times more likely to die from heart disease. I'm 60 times more likely to die from cancer. Two times more likely to die by suicide, and that rate actually increases incredibly amongst our young people, which you've already heard today. Um, it is, in fact, the leading cause of death amongst our young Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, which in this day and age are compliant, completely unacceptable. The reality of it is, is I am an overweight, um, as classified in the Australian um, body mass scale in index, 30-year-old, 30 38-year-old female. Um, I don't have a lot of time, and this is really important for me to share my story and to advocate for the rights of my people and to share it in a way that people can understand it that they haven't before. And I think what's important with the work that we're doing in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Lived Experience Centre is really relatable for everyone. I have survived three suicide attempts all in my youth. And when I was 10 years old, I lost my mother to suicide. I have lost a significant best friend when I was a teenager, my sister and countless others in my community. I never actually thought that I would be doing the work that I'm doing today, but it seems destined as part of my ancestors' story for me and my journey and what I'm meant to be doing. I am grateful to still be here and to be able to champion what is the reality for our people in communities. I just wanted to talk a little bit about how did we get here to actually setting up the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Lived Experience Centre? This actually spans from what you're going to hear shortly, which is the work of the Lifespan Project and a partnership with the Centre for Best Practice in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Suicide Prevention under the leadership of Professor Pat Dudgeon in University of Western Australia. We partnered with um, the Black Dog Institute and the Lifespan team to be able to lead and inform the work that was done in the national suicide prevention trial sites for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. As such, there were several key reports and pieces of work that we were able to do, um, including looking into what does the research and evidence tell us for lived experience with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So we conducted a literature review. We also held an ethics approved workshop. Um, I love this photo. This photo was taken in Perth at our workshop and these are all of the amazing people that came together from across the country. Um, myself and Tanya Hirovona, along with Pat, led a facilitated discussion with a group of lived experience representatives all the way from the Kimberley Broom um, through to New South Wales, Perth and Queensland. We had diversity amongst our group. We had elders and respected traditional owners, we had LGBTQI people, we had young people, we had males and females, and it was really important that we could um, gather information from everyone. Part of that story really spoke to the fact that we have not been able to define what lived experience looks like for us. The current definition in Australia does not reflect colonisation. It does not reflect our ongoing issues with racism, with segregation, and everything else that's happening in our communities. We are in a situation now where there is a massive response uh, across the world, and yet we continue to lose at far higher rates people to suicide in this country. We are doing a lot of work to improve that, and through the voices of our lived experience, and that being if we've had instances where we've survived suicide attempts, where we've been bereaved by suicide, it's really important that our voices are heard at the table. What we have now is the issue of myself and a handful of people who are actually invited at a very high level to share that input, but there is not enough response on services and new programs and policy development on the ground. And the work that we're doing at the centre is designed to better support Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people through culturally appropriate and informed um, structures, so counselling services, training, 
um, taking away all the risks that we can to bring them to the table for services and governments to be better informed by those of which are directly impacted by the policies and services that we're implementing in suicide prevention. This slide here was a pivotal point in my journey and particularly for me not having a mother or a grandmother or paternal or maternal figures um, to support me. And this is when we were actually successful with the Department of Health in gaining funding to set up the centre in Canberra. You will see in there um, Minister Ken Wyatt, uh, Tom Karma and Pat Dudgeon. And I felt very much cheered on by my family, although not blood related. Uh, the recognition for lived experience of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in this country has really shifted and it's important that we keep that going. This here is a bit of a quote um, from Pat in our report. The lived experience of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples was different to others. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander experience is contextualised within a history of colonisation that has resulted in disadvantage, racism, lack of cultural differences and exclusion. And we need to make sure that we are leading the work that we're doing in this. When we approach the Black Dog Institute to potentially partner with us and set this up, the first answer was no. And that was our cue that they got it because they were like, oh, no, we're not Aboriginal and that's not our leadership and we shouldn't be doing this. And we said, well, that's why we want your support so that we can come in and we can lead this and we can make a difference together with the experience that Black Dog Institute brings and all the passionate staff. It's really good time to be able to um, build the evidence base. It's the first time in Australia that this has been done and it's also from our knowledge the first time in the world that First Nations people can start to really explore what it's like to have their voices of lived experience included. And this has been particularly difficult amongst communities where there is not support to do that, where there is still stigma, where there is still a belief that if you talk about suicide and mental illness that you are making it worse. What we're doing is providing support to our community members that they feel more comfortable and safe to do so. One of the things that I find really important is to share our hope for the future. Um, we have a lot going on and we're, we're currently funded to set up in three areas, but there's such a need that I've been hearing even since I started eight months ago to do it across the country and we need support to do that. I'd like to finish by sharing a video which was created a couple of years ago at the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Suicide Prevention um, conference. It's a biannual conference. This video was written and performed by um, a range of people at the conference and it has been produced by Culture is Life and it talks to our hope for the future and to love.
Uh, as long as you're feeling love, that's all that matters in the end of the day. I see so many people trying to fit in, but be yourself is the way. Never care what they say, stay on your grind, and everything will be okay. Shoot for the stars, forget all your troubles in the day. Keep your head full of hope and your heart full of love. Remember where you came from and who you are. Culture is everything, and culture is life. So when I'm rapping on the mic, I bring my culture to life. We all destined to rise, we weren't born to fall So if you see a brother and sister down at the dumps Give a helping hand up and ask if they're okay Cause no family should have to bury their loved ones On any given day Thank you Thank you, Delani. Thank you so much. Um, I think it takes enormous courage, um, enormous courage and vulnerability to to present yourself in front of an audience such as this and tell a, a, such a remarkable story. So thank you to Delani for um, for reminding us uh, how important lived experience is, and, and of course, most importantly, through the lens of Indigenous and Aboriginal uh, Australians. Uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, we are about half, ooh, just under halfway through. I'm loving the comments on YouTube. Um, Michelle Gordon, thank you very much, of course. Uh, we will send you some more stuff on Alani's project. Um, lots of really fantastic comments, so please keep them coming through. It's really great for the presenters here today. Now, of course, uh, most of you I know, uh, I would assume, are in your PJs at home, and uh, that's, a, that's the right place to be at the moment. It is fine to get up and make a cup of tea, make sure that you are well looked after, uh, looked after and ready for our next uh, presentation. I'm really, really, really excited to present our next uh, presenter, Janie McGoldrick, uh, who's going to talk about suicide prevention. And actually, the next two presentations are about suicide prevention. Obviously, this is a difficult space um, for, for many of us and for some especially, so please look after yourself uh, if, you are, if you are watching this at home and it, and it presents um, topics that are uncomfortable or, or um, are comfortable for you. Um, so, Janie is going to talk about sharing the best practices in suicide prevention nationally. Um, Janie McCodrick is our Senior Manager of the National Suicide Prevention Program for the Black Dog. She's uh, had 25 years experience uh, piloting, scaling and evaluating educational programs across Australia and NZ. Sorry, Australia, UK and Australia. UK and Australia. She'd never been to New Zealand, forget that. She's passionate about developing strategy and partnerships to support mental health and wellbeing programs, and she's focused on systemic change and long-term sustainability. Please welcome to the stage, Joni. Thank you, Taz, and good morning, everybody. Thank you for listening. My deep-rooted curiosity and passion for mental health began when I was around uh, seven years old, when my dad took me and my three sisters to visit his mum, my grandma, in Knapsbury Hospital, that you can see here on the right-hand side of the slide. It's a beautiful building, opened in 1905, had capacity for around 1,200 patients as a psychiatric hospital, or mental asylum, as they were referred to back then. However, it was also used during the First and World War as a military hospital. Unfortunately, my grandma spent her whole life there, from the age of about 22, having fled Kerry in the west of Ireland with children born out of wedlock. She soon landed in London, became unwell and was diagnosed with schizophrenia. My dad and his siblings grew up in a children's home as a result. I have really vivid memories of walking down the corridor on the left-hand side, Seven, eight years old, it was quite a distressing place to be. There was many patients that were behind locked doors looking very distressed. And what I couldn't understand is that my nan seemed really normal. We had normal conversations that you'd have with your grandma. And I thought, why, why have they locked her up? Why does she have to stay here her whole life? Thankfully, our models of care have changed. Our treatment of those with mental illness has changed significantly, and I no longer need to worry about family being treated like a criminal, essentially, and locked up. Two of my three sisters have uh, poor mental health, multiple suicide attempts, and one of them does spend time in a psychiatric hospital very many times through the year, but usually for two or three weeks. So you'll understand my deep-rooted curiosity and passion for working for Black Dog and my desire to understand what works and why? 
What could we do differently? How can we improve care for people in the system? And I have the privilege of working with some of the best researchers, of your, as you've already seen, at Black Dog, and translating that on the ground into programmes to reduce, essentially, human suffering and, ultimately, reduce suicide deaths and attempts globally. You may know suicide is the leading cause of death in Australia for 15 to 44-year-olds. Just think about that for a moment. More than 3,000 Australians end their lives each year, 3,046 in the last ABS report. That's more than eight people a day. We lose more people to suicide than die on our roads each year. Males are three times more likely to die by suicide than females, and you heard from Leilani, more than twice as high for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. There's been a 20% increase in suicidality in the last decade. This is not going away or being resolved yet. However, thankfully, some things are underway in recognition of this pervasive and tragic issue affecting lives, families, communities across Australia. From a government perspective in Australia, it's wonderful to see Christine Morgan appointed as suicide prevention advisor to the PM. We have the Victorian Royal Commission going on in the mental health system right now. The recent Productivity Commission highlighted the 180 billion annual economic costs for mental illness, an estimated 16 to 34 billion for suicide. But there continues to be a lack of funding and investment in a sustained and evidence-based approach to suicide prevention. So what are we doing at Black Dog about this? You've heard Lifespan referenced several times already if you've been tuning in since the beginning of our showcase. The Black Dog Institute currently supports the implementation of systems approaches to suicide prevention in 29 trial sites across Australia. You can see the map on the right-hand side there, the scope and breadth of the work we do. You've heard the lifespan framework referenced. Black Dog is implementing an Australian first. Lifespan is bringing international, evidence-based programs and interventions from across the world to every state and territory in Australia. And if, like me, you're not a scientist and a researcher, you may wonder what does, what does this mean, this evidence-based systems approach that we talk about. A systems approach for us in the lifespan model is essentially delivering simultaneously a range of implementations that are evidence-based at the same time. In our lifespan model, this includes across health, youth, community, and it's all underpinned by data and evidence. So it's not enough to hold a community campaign, for example, to reduce stigma without offering community members access to training. We, we use one called QPR, Question, Persuade, Refer. This is a one-hour training program that allows people in the community to build the skills to have a conversation with somebody that may be suicidal. If any of you have experienced that, it's hard. You can panic. You might not know what to say, what to do. So we're very much about building up, skilling everybody to create a community net with programs such as, such as QPR. And it's not enough to upskill community and friends and colleagues to support distressed individuals and refer them to a healthcare system without upskilling and building the capacity of our healthcare professionals to respond to patients who are presenting with suicidal thoughts. So we work with GPs, we work with emergency department staff. Our systems approach means we holistically and simultaneously work across a region to build a community-wide safety net that recognises the need for us all to be part of this solution. We work with schools to implement an evidence-based solution, a suicide prevention programme for staff. You've heard Elisa talk about the wonderful future-proofing study too. We work with media outlets on how to report sensibly around suicide to prevent further harm. This holistic work from an evidence base is crucial. It saves lives, often young lives. Many of the regions we work with, we refer to as priority populations. Across these 29 trial sites, many have an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander focus, where suicidality, as we'd heard, is three times the rate of the general population. In Townsville, it's veterans who have a suicide rate of more than twice the general population. Much of our work is in regional Australia, in rural and remote communities, where with limited resources, a doctor, a psychologist, a hospital can be miles away, hours away. 
As a medical research institute and knowledge translation organisation, we have a laser focus on data and evidence-based approaches. A key part of our work is the interpretation and dissemination of suicide analysis data and reports to health professionals on the ground. My colleague Matt Phillips will talk more to that shortly. But importantly, our ability to disseminate suicide data to people on the ground has meant meaningful localised planning. The right interventions for the right people at the right time. For example, you can imagine if there's a devastating instance in a community of a young person that dies by suicide, all those resources can be diverted into youth. What our data and our reports often highlight for the huge regions that we work across is that there are often other cohorts of the population that may be more hidden or in the media less, but that this issue impacts and really, needs our, really need our help. So, for example, I've just returned from Tasmania, where suicidality is an issue in older people, those between 65 to 85, and closely linked to issues of isolation and loneliness. What I'd like to show you now before uh, we finish one more slide after is a video which is really showcasing feedback from our colleagues on the ground across the primary health networks and all the professionals we support that do this work in the communities we support. With thanks to the federal government, the Black Dog Institute is leading the national suicide prevention trials, which is an Australian first. We're driving critical connections and partnerships, providing resources and education to build the capacity of a much needed workforce to reduce suicide rates in Australia. As research leaders and implementation experts, we're enabling delivery and scale of a systems-based approach to suicide prevention. Let's hear from our colleagues on the ground in the communities we support. The motivation to start this work was one of my soldiers taking his life in some time ago. What keeps me going is the, the knowledge that the work we're doing is impacting, changing and indeed saving lives. I think one of the great benefits and strengths of working with the Black Dog Institute is we know we can reach back into the expertise that Black Dog offers. You know, it's a kind of internationally renowned organisation. Uh, I think Black Dog Institute has provided great um, foundation. So when you're coming to this role, there's evidence based, so you know what you're the delivering has the evidence, so you've got the confidence to move forward with that, but also reaching out to the staff for their expertise and their guidance has been wonderful. Everyone in the network needs to understand the lifespan model and they also need to think about, okay, look, we need to operate collaboratively and as a system for tackling this issue. The systems approach for us has been absolutely critical. And of course, the audit data that we've received from the Black Dog Institute has been critical with that because what that did was really help the work we're doing with the National Parks team around a particular suicide hotspot. What I really found valuable was the access to the suicide audit data for our region, the North Coast as well as specifically to the Clarence Valley. That's helped in our planning as well, which has been really good. I've also really appreciated the access to the Confluence website. There's a whole range of guidelines and templates and, and knowledge sharing on that, which has been invaluable and also the support from the suicide prevention trial team. We want to keep the momentum going. Um, you know, it's been a lot of um, building trust and, and building relationships and, and networking and, and talking and delivering training and that's all been fantastic, but we need to now keep that going. So it's all about promoting accessibility and also for our community to know what the resources are that they can access. Right help for the right person at the right time. I suppose one of the biggest successes is we've managed to train at least well, over 3,000 people in our community in mental health literacy training and that's right across the whole cohort. I also like the fact that we've been able to enable to go out to our community and really um, let people know any events whatsoever that we do where they can access help, where, how they can access the help and who they can go to. We've actually had people come up to us in the street in Townsville to say, this has changed my life. Um, trust in the system. That lifespan model is pretty effective. I know that we are making a difference. So I'd like to finish for a moment thinking about the future of suicide prevention. 
My team and I have worked through an extensive innovation and consultation process over the last eight months. We have travelled Australia to meet with many of our colleagues you've just heard from on the ground doing the hard suicide prevention work in their communities to ask what was working and why? What can Black Dog do more of? What do we need to do less of? How else can we support you in doing this work? What was missing? Overwhelmingly, our colleagues, as you have just heard, have told us Black Dog's role in leading evidence-based approaches to suicide prevention is crucial. Our capacity to build those critical connections, partnerships, providing the education, the training, the resources is highly regarded and is integral to building the capacity of this much-needed workforce. Our vision, therefore, is to find innovative ways to diversify our funding through the development of what we see as a blended business model that requires investment and will include a fee-for-service component to generate revenue and ensure that the sustainability of our work and mission continues beyond next June 2020 when our funding is finished. We want to continue this work to drive down suicide rates, deaths and attempts to save lives across Australia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janie. That was, um, that was really so very insightful and wonderful to see those um, folks on the ground at the bit the program is directly benefiting. And that one quote that stood out to me in that speech was um, someone came up to me in this, on the street and told me this, this, this had changed their life. And I think that really sums up and epitomises what Black Dog does. So the work that Janie does is so critical in the suicide prevention space, but how is it informed? It's informed through data. Now, if you like data, you're going to love this next session. Um, Matthew Phillips is uh, a data expert. I'm going to say data expert. I'm looking at him. He's shrugging, but I'm going to call him our data expert. He's going to talk about about the power of data and analytics in suicide prevention. So Matt's role as data manager at Black Dog Institute is to identify data sources where relevant information can be collated, manipulated and mapped in order to gain a greater understanding of the factual details surrounding suicide and suicide attempts. Now, let me just hark back to the beginning of our, um, of our session today to say that, once again, I am not the smartest person when it comes to science, and I have seen Matt's presentation and I understood it. So if you love data, you're going to love this. Welcome to the stage, Matthew. Thanks for the introduction there, Taz. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Matthew Phillips, and for close to five years, I worked in the health insurance industry. What began as an amazing experience building data warehouses for government accountability reporting slowly transitioned into identifying profitable members and developing targeted marketing campaigns. I really began to loathe my work. I began waking up on weekdays thinking of leaving and wishing the work week to be over. Life is valuable and I was wasting it in something I didn't believe in. After the daily seek email alerts and viewing job postings, I stumbled across a role at the Black Dog Institute on the Lifespan Project. I am extremely passionate about reducing suicides. Looking into our Lifespan community survey, we found just over one in two people reported knowing someone who had died by suicide. Since transitioning into the role, I've managed to contribute to data platforms that support suicide prevention, and it's given me a sense of purpose again that I deeply believe in. Every death by suicide is unique and possibly preventable tragedy, and the causes are immensely complex. A major challenge hampering existing suicide prevention efforts has been a lack of detail about the full scale and extent of the issue. At the Black Dog Institute, we're harnessing the power of data to piece together our clearest picture yet, where suicide deaths and attempts are occurring and what could be done at a local level to help prevent them. In collaboration with the Australian National University and SAS, the Black Dog Institute has developed a suicide prevention intelligence system to help gain insights and local communities develop more targeted and evidence-based suicide prevention initiatives. The system is currently being developed as part of Black Dog's groundbreaking trial lifespan. Additional funding would be required to scale nationally, 
but providing and providing those meaningful planning for suicide prevention activities. The Suicide Prevention Intelligence System incorporates multiple data sets acquired through robust partnerships with data custodians. And by bringing together data sets such as death data, attempt data through hospitalization, emergency, ambulance, population and socioeconomic indexes with the potential to add additional data sets. We are able to draw meaningful insights and make sense of data with our local communities. We can provide private health networks and local councils with information about what is happening in their district, who is at risk and where danger spots are in their communities so they can target their prevention activities. These these data insights will help drive policy as well as provide support to mental health commissions through relevant learnings and insights. It has the ability to support researchers to promote uh, responsible reporting within the media. Analyzing these data sources at a local level will reveal important information that can't be gleaned by looking at Australian-wide or even state-based trends. A huge benefit of this system is the ability to develop local area audits. The key aim of these audits is to monitor trends, identify high-risk vulnerable groups to suicide, and inform the development and implementation of local strategies to minimise risk. These reports aim to deliver specific information in a way that has meaningful implications for how to translate findings into practical outcomes. One of the key strategies of the audit can be to inform on means restriction. Means restriction has been found to be one of the most effective standalone suicide prevention activities. Means restriction has traditionally been associated with placing barriers at locations where suicides have occurred. We use the broader definition of means restriction, which is any activity which interrupts a suicide attempt. Using this broader definition, means restriction may include ensuring that pill cases dispense one pill at a time, advising families how to make safe uh, the home safe for a relative at risk, removing ligature points, providing training for people to understand risk signs and how to respond to someone in crisis. At the forefront of our audits and the intelligent system is the ability to visualise multiple data, so uh, data sources and show the importance of spatial resolution. This visual here shows that higher geographic levels can hide important, uh, important gained granular level details there. So this map measures socioeconomic advantage and disadvantage. The green indicates areas of vantage, while red indicates areas of disadvantage. Due to the level of resolution on the left, you would assume that the area is more affluent, while on the right, we can clearly see the indications where support may be required. Visualising data geospatially helps depict concentrations of where suicide deaths are occurring in local sites. Incidents that occur away from home can be isolated and key hotspots and areas can be identified, allowing for prevention activities. Though the initiative is still in its trial phase and resourced for New South Wales, it is already providing an invaluable tool for proactive prevention activities on the ground. Thanks to data analytics, a high-risk location within the north coast, a lifespan trial site, was identified. This contributed to a number of consultations with National Park and Wildlife Services, Lifeline, local area coordinators, and it led to means restriction activities, the development of a new lookout, as well as engaging signage. Similarly, in the Murrumbidgee trial site, data was used to identify vulnerable groups and individuals who were targeted through new promotional campaigns through traditional and social media ways, as well as evidence-based training delivered at community forums for those identified individuals. 
In a testament to the project's life-saving work, the Lifespan Data team were named highly commended finalists in the 2019 Research Australia Data Innovation Award. Currently, Australia does not have a single national data set on suicide deaths, hospitalisations, police or ambulance data. Recently, the Commonwealth Government announced investment into a new national system for collecting and enhancing self-harm and suicide data. This initiative is being led by the Australian Institute of Health and Wellbeing, and the Black Dog Institute welcomes this initiative, as it should offer a complex national set of information from a diverse range of sources. Our intelligence system will add value to this national collation of data by being able to look at the micro level, teasing out significant learnings and providing tailored solutions that work for each community across the country, which can then be put into practice. While the journey is just the beginning, it is our hope along with the help of our communities, our health networks and supporters, that we can use this data and continue to develop intricate and robust safety nets. Thank you for your time today. Thanks, Taz. Thank you so much, Matt. That was uh, absolutely fascinating and we truly appreciate your time and effort in preparing that. Thank you very much. Okay, so we've got three more presentations to go. We're at uh, 10.20, so we'll probably be done about 10.40, 10, oh, sorry, um, closer to 11. Uh, and we're going to change gears a little bit now, folks. And uh, we've talked um, a lot about suicide prevention in the last couple of uh, presentations, and now we're going to move on to workplace mental health. Um, and it is such a pleasure. I really tr I love introducing Sam because he's, um, he's our chief psychiatrist. He's our absolute guru in this space. And... Before we come on, wait there, I have to introduce you properly. <laughs> he is also, um, as I said before, there are many of our researchers and experts have, um, uh, uh, what's the right way to say it, double degrees, you know, um, the things that they are also trained in. He's a psychiatrist, he's our chief psychiatrist, but he's also an epidemiologist. Uh, and what a fascinating time for Sam to come and talk to us in his current work environment. He's got a particular interest in the overlap between mental health, physical health and work, and uh, we absolutely love him. Welcome to the stage. Professor Sam Harvey. Thank you very much. Um, we've heard a lot today about already about prevention and how we might be able to prevent mental health problems. And one of the things I really believe is if you're going to get prevention happening, we're going to have to do this outside of the health service. And we've already heard earlier about what we need to be doing in schools. And what I want to talk is about what we need to be doing in workplaces. And in particular, I, I want to talk about some of the work we've been doing with uh, most at-risk workers. My journey in this space really began about 15 years ago when I was working in London. And at that point, my clinical work was I was the psychiatrist for the London Ambulance Service. And my research was focused around looking at the mental health of soldiers coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. And these two things I was doing really collided when the London bombing happened and obviously we were then finding ourselves caring for a lot of ambulance workers who'd been involved in the events of that day and a lot of them were suffering from mental health problems after what had happened, including post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, substance misuse. And, and, and really what was extraordinary was when I started to look for what evidence there was to help us understand this, to think about how some of this could have been pre present, prevented, there was remarkably little out there. And, and so what really started from there was a program of research around how can we better understand the mental health of first responders? And in particular, then, what can we be doing to try and improve that? And so since 2012, I've been running a program of research at the Black Dog Institute around this, and we've learnt a lot about first responder mental health. And when I say first responders, I mean police, fire, ambulance, uh, volunteer firefighters. We know that one in 10 of them have symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. That, that's one in 10 of the first responders that are out there working at the moment. If we look amongst retired first responders, it's probably even higher. We've also been mapping how the 
incidents of PTSD, depression, sleep problems, how that just gradually accumulates the more traumatic episodes that somebody's exposed to. But what's the point in, in gaining all this information? Well, really, it's about then trying to understand what we can be doing in the workplace to try and prevent some of these first responders becoming unwell. And if we can do that, if we can prevent firefighters and police officers and paramedics becoming unwell from what they see, then surely that has to have implications for other workplaces. Now, when we first started doing this work and when we started going out into first responder organisations, one of the th comments we were often met with is, well, you know, we don't want to wait for your research to tell us the answers. We're groups of people that like to go out. When the bells ring, we go out and just do stuff and, and we do what's right. And, and that sort of culture had really come across into how they handled mental health. And, and so what happened, and, and in still, indeed still what happens around the world, when there's a big incident, so when there was the London bombings, the initial response was, well, we need to do debriefing of all of the police and ambulance officers that were involved in this. We need to get them in. We need to do proper debriefing. Now, we now know that's exactly the wrong thing to do, that bringing people in, making them talk about those experiences too early actually re-traumatises them and increases their risk of post-traumatic stress disorder. So I think it's, a, it, it's really a crucial example of why you need to have research behind these decisions because it's only through doing the research we're going to understand what works and what doesn't work. And so now, across the world, debriefing, we know that we tell people not to do that. But let's flip that around. What is it that we are telling these organisations to do and, and what do we know does work? And I want to go back to some of the research that I was talking about that we were doing with military personnel coming back from overseas deployments in the Middle East. And we all know that there were high rates of mental health problems when these soldiers came home, particularly post-traumatic stress disorder. But what was extraordinary is that if you looked at soldiers who described them, their unit as having good leadership, they had one-tenth of the rates of PTSD that we saw more generally amongst military personnel. So leadership and getting the leaders in an organisation behaving appropriately is hugely important in terms of protecting the mental health. Since we found that in the military, we've been looking amongst other groups and we've been looking amongst ambulance officers and have found exactly the same thing, that the more supportive your manager behaviour, the lower the rates of mental health problems. But that's great. The real question is, can you teach managers and leaders to do this stuff better? Or is it just that some people are born being good leaders and they're going to do it well, and if you're being managed by someone who's not, well, then you're stuffed. And so what we've developed, though, is we didn't believe that mantra. We thought, no, we think from a mental health point of view, you can actually teach people how to manage these problems better. And so we worked with the fire service here in New South Wales. We developed a four-hour training program for their managers that didn't bore them with lectures about what is depression, what is PTSD. It focused on teaching them the skills that they needed to have to have these conversations with people. Now, I ranted earlier about the need for research, and so what we did was we randomised half of the managers in New South Wales to get this training, and the other half just to continue with the normal training, and then we followed them and their teams up for six months. Six months down the track, the managers that were randomly assigned to get this four-hour training program about mental health, their teams had 18% lower rates of sickness absence than the other managers. We've now rolled that training out to over 3,000 managers so we estimate the, the benefit of that to be a saving of around $27 million in terms of reduced sickness absence. And in case you think this is me telling mistruths or, or overselling things, this, this research was all published in The Lancet Psychiatry, one of the best journals out there. But what about an individual level? What can we be doing with individual workers? We were hearing earlier about the power of harnessing technology, and particularly smartphones, and, and we developed a smartphone app called Headgear, and if you're interested in this, you can go to the App Store and you can download this, this app, which is now freely available. And, and the point of this app was to provide a tool for workers to be able to monitor their mental health and to be able to undertake a, a program over 30 days where they gradually built up a range of skills which 
the evidence suggested to us, should be things that help prevent some of them developing mental health problems. But again, we wanted to test that idea. And so what we did was we got 2,000 workers. Now, these were workers who were not depressed, but many of them were feeling stressed and overwhelmed. And they downloaded the app and they got randomly got two different versions of the app, one that just monitored their symptoms, the other one that did got them to do this 30-day program. And then we followed them up for a year. And what we found was the people who just had the mood monitoring smartphone app, about 7% of them developed depression over that year. A high rate, but we knew they were an at-risk group when we were following them. The really important thing is that those that got the headgear app, half the rates of new episodes of depression. So this research was the first time that we'd been able to show that a smartphone app could prevent the onset of depression in an at-risk group, and to date is still the largest trial of a mental health app. But I said right at the start that one of the reasons we were focusing on these high-risk groups was so that we could learn about how to help other workers. And one of the things that we're all very focused about at the moment is how our healthcare system is going to cope with what's happening, and in particular with the, the COVID-19 epidemic around the world. We know from when we've seen previous epidemics like this in a, on, in a more geographically contained space like SARS and Ebola, that there's huge pressure put on the healthcare workers. Not only are they working long hours, but they're worried about their health, their family's health. Often they have to go into quarantine for a period of time. So all of those things that I've described there that we've been developing with first responders, the manager training, the apps, we're now modifying them for healthcare workers and are trying to roll them out and test them within the healthcare setting to see whether they can protect those workers in the way that they've been able to protect first responders. So this is where we're at at the moment. We want to know, can we replicate what we've achieved with first responders in other groups, like healthcare workers, like teachers, apprentices, a whole range of different groups. We also want to look at how we can find other ways to teach workers those skills that we were teaching them in the app for the workers who don't want to engage with an app, who prefer to do stuff face-to-face -face or, or in other ways. But I think critically is that last point, is can workplaces be the place where mental health prevention happens? And the reason I have the no smoking sign there is if we look at the achievements that we in medicine have made with cardiovascular disease in terms of preventing stroke and preventing heart disease, it's not through, primarily, it's not through having better treatments for high blood pressure, better treatments for heart attacks. It's about the things that we've done out in people's workplaces. It's about banning smoking, increasing physical activity. That's where we've made the real impact, and our great hope is that in mental health, we can see those same sort of impacts by getting things working better in the workplace. So I, I want to thank you for listening and, and hearing about our research, and um, very sad we can't speak in person, but I hope that via various other means we can keep this conversation going. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. Um, we have uh, quite a number of organisations uh, on the uh, YouTube channel, and I can just I can just see what they're thinking at the moment. Absolutely wonderful information on mental health and leadership and the workforce. And uh, thank you, Sam, very much for that. Very insightful. Um, before we move on to our next presenter, we've got two more presenters left. I just really want to thank uh, Draft Works Events. Uh, lots of comments on the YouTube channel talking about how professional it is, and that is really all down to them. So thanks to the guys who have done an incredible job um, and making us look so well today. And also thank you to Stone and Chalk for having us today. Um, we're a humble not-for-profit and it's partnerships and supports like this that make us, um, enable us to do these fantastic sessions. All right, that leads me very well into the next session, which is actually going to be a virtual session with Professor Catherine Boydell. Uh, it's going to be on arts on prescription. So this is a really interesting space around, I'll let Catherine obviously explain this, but what the role that arts plays in mental health. Uh, Professor Bordell is a sociologist and has earned an international reputation for her leadership of novel strategies for translating imperial knowledge. Uh, her knowledge translation activities are focused on using the arts in the creation and dissemination of research. <clears throat> Excuse me. Her research has had an important and lasting impact on bringing the arts and sciences together achieving sustainable academic impact in terms of shifting and understanding advancing theory and knowledge both within and across disciplines. Okay, so we're going to try and do the whole virtual thing um, and welcome to the stage Professor Catherine Boydell. There you are. 
Thank you. Thanks very much, Taz, and thank you for accommodating me virtually. I'm much appreciated. Picture this. A young woman in her early 30s sits in the crowded waiting room of her GP's office. She's the mother of three young children under the age of four and currently nursing the youngest who's in the waiting room with her. She's exhausted and lethargic all of the time and feels overwhelmed by everything. She worries there's something physically and or mentally wrong with her. After spending some time discussing the details of what's going on in her everyday life, her doctor hands her a script with, this woman needs a dinner out with no babies attached written on it. That woman was me. This was my first introduction to what is now called social prescribing, or as the Danish call it, culture of vitamins. Could I have slide two, please? So what exactly is social prescribing? Well, social prescribing links people to non-medical services in the community, creating an intentional pathway between clinical care and non-clinical supports. And what it really does is recognize the social determinants of health, the fact that people's health and well-being can be affected by a range of factors, social, economic, and environmental, and a growing recognition that health consumer needs, at least some of them, could be better met by other kinds of supports in the community. We know that anxiety and depression can often be caused by something amiss in our environment. So, for example, if a patient comes to a clinic for depression and they're depressed because they're marginally housed or in debt over their head, then medical treatments and psychological therapies may not be the only answer. So social prescribing is holistic, it's person it's tailored to individual need. It focuses on the non-medical needs affecting health and well-being by linking people to local community and cultural groups or organizations. For example, this could include exercise on prescription, arts on prescription, lunch clubs, walking groups, think park run, or even debt advice to, to help with a wide range of problems including social isolation, housing issues, or unemployment. So we might ask ourselves, why are those with experience of mental health issues well suited to a social prescribing approach? Well, we know that people in experiencing mental health issues often have difficulty engaging with the community due to stigma, isolation, and marginalization, um, leading often to low levels of social isolation and loneliness. And in fact, a recent study on loneliness indicates that social isolation is associated with an astounding 29% rise in mortality. In fact, in response to the epidemic of loneliness in the UK, there is now a minister for loneliness to address this issue. And I think what's really important important is that uh, loneliness is not just an epidemic of older adults, but there's been increasing uh, popular press on the preponderance of uh, loneliness in our young people as well. The United Kingdom, in fact, uh, has been at the forefront of social prescribing, where it's received substantial funding, it's being scaled up across the country as a core component of the NHS. It's also been taken up in several Canadian provinces. For example, in Quebec, all GPs are able to prescribe museum visits for their patients, for families up to four members, to uh, gain a free entry pass to museums across the province. And in the province of Ontario, where I'm from, community mental health centres have social prescribing as integral to their services. And this is really um, in not only urban centres, but also rural and uh, remote communities in the province as well. And I think what's really important about these initiatives is that they're underpinned by rigorous research. And early findings are showing very positive results at the micro, meso and, mi and macro level. Now, what's happened in Australia? We're seeing a rise. Uh, interest in social prescribing, with eye care scaling it up for their injured workers, and a recent roundtable report on social prescribing was published just this year. So what is Black Dog doing? Following a design thinking workshop held at Black 18 months ago to focus on what would constitute an idea. Our stakeholders told us that a holistic approach encompassing social determinants of health would be ideal. As a result, we're committed to addressing these social determinants of health with our exercise physiology program embedded in our clinic and our current research exploring the efficacy of arts on prescription, another component of social prescribing, to address mild to moderate depression. Now, arts interventions are considered non-invasive, low-risk treatment options, increasingly used to supplement more traditional biomedical treatments. Could I have slide three, please? 
So what is the evidence for arts on prescription? Can engagement with the arts affect social determinants of health, improve social cohesion, and reduce social inequities? Well, burgeoning global research would suggest a resounding yes. The all-parliamentary report on the creative arts and health in the UK in 2017 was instrumental in demonstrating the beneficial impact of engagement with the arts on individuals, communities, societies. And I think of particular note in this document with the significant reductions in emergency department visits, as well as fewer visits to the GP. And again, they very explicitly costed out some of these savings, which showed um, a, a very uh, intense uh, economic benefit. I think really important to our work has been the recent World Health Organization report. It was launched in November of 2019 on the arts and health. And this was an important report because it was based on a review of 3,000 plus studies. The evidence showing the positive impact of art on both physical and mental health, extending across social, physiological, and psychological spheres. And I've just put up on this slide some of the benefits that were outlined in the many studies in that particular report. And I think, again, what's really really significant is that in many contexts, these benefits translate into a reduced need for medical intervention and a corresponding reduction in health service use. And I think these benefits really highlight the intrinsic and instrumental value of arts engagement. So with this groundswell of empirical evidence regarding the arts' positive impact on both physical and mental health and well-being, why shouldn't it be as readily available to the public as any medications? Slide four, please. Thank you. Now, we wanted to extend the research base to the Australian mental health context, and we've conducted a pilot study of an Arts on Prescription program. In partnership with the Art Gallery of New South Wales, we provided an eight-week arts engagement program for adults impacted by depression. The weekly art gallery workshop was delivered by a professional artist and a program producer at the gallery, and it was supported by a mental health professional. And I think what's really important to note here is that the program is much more than simply creating art. I also want to make note that the photos in these slides show our group at the gallery, and they're not stock photos. And again, I think that's really important. Uh, each one of the weekly workshops took place over two hours and included a range of visual art engagement experiences, starting with close observation and group-led discussion on a selection of artworks. And these could have been installations, or sculptures, or a particular group of portraits which really inspired our creative thinking prior to the actual art making experiences. And I think what was really critical was that this discussion process amongst the group really allowed the group to acquaint themselves with each other and really aim to create personal connections with the artworks as well as with the group. Our participants were um, also asked to use a visual arts process diary that they really found quite helpful um, using it in each, each session to write the reflections of their creative experience. Each of the uh, sessions focused on a discussion in terms of sharing reflections about the art making, about what the process was like, the direction that participants aimed to take their artwork, the subject matter, and the impact that this process had on their lives. What participants did was created a portfolio throughout the sessions and selected their artworks uh, they wanted to build into pieces for a temporary uh, ex exhibition in the gallery and at Black Dog. They also wrote artist statements to accompany their artwork. What we did was we measured mental health and well-being and social inclusion and elements of recovery before and after the intervention in both the group that received the program and a waitlist control group. We had 36 participants who were randomized, and following the eight-week session, we held a psychosocial group discussion that allowed participants to really reflect on their experiences, and they actually worked to co-analyze their responses together, which was really an interesting process. Could I have slide five, please? Preliminary results from our pilot study indicated that the program was feasible and well-received by participants. And I think from a research perspective, which was really exciting for us, is that we completed our recruitment in 24 hours, the first 24 hours, I think, which is pretty unheard of in research. And we had only one dropout over eight weeks. And again, I think quite significant because when we began the study, we were really concerned about the efficacy of having um, individuals participating in a research study who would actually make it to the art gallery you know, every week for a series of eight, eight weeks.
Our results show that participant mental health and well-being and social inclusion increased significantly following the program for the group who received the Arts on Prescription, but not for the waitlist control group. Our analysis of the diaries and the narrative text from group discussions and interviews showed the powerful impact of connecting with others and engaging with art together in a non-stigmatizing social setting. And I think you can see from some of the uh, selected quotes on the slide how significant this was in a, this very brief period of time. I think what's also really important to our team is the fact that many of the participants have continued to meet at the gallery weekly following the formal program. And we're now seeking additional resources and funding to extend this small pilot study to study the Arts on Prescription program with a larger group and with longer follow-up. And certainly that was really um, a pervasive theme in the qualitative text. Our participants were really wanting this to be an ongoing program that they could access um, on a regular basis. I really would like us um, to encourage us to acknowledge the importance of arts and culture for well-being and reflect on the ways in which social prescribing, specifically arts on prescription, has the potential to help all individuals experiencing mental health issues. It has a strong role in helping us to shift the balance to focus to prevention and early intervention and to increase health care, consumer participation and engagement. And I think these are really important themes when we look at any policy documents currently, the importance of co-creation and co-design and really involving consumers meaningfully in the research process. So with the huge challenges we face regarding mental health and well-being, social isolation and loneliness, and its resulting costs, we urgently need to consider our approach to healthcare in Australia, and social prescribing offers an innovative solution. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Catherine. That was uh, that was really, really fascinating. I just find that that area of our work um, so interesting. And a question from uh, online here has: Has the work extended beyond the visual arts to look at engagement at the performing arts? Um, so we'll come back to you on that, uh, Michelle. Thank you very much for that question. Uh, okay, we are up to our lucky last, ladies and gentlemen. It has been wow. It's gone a lot quicker than we thought. It's um, it's been just wonderful. So up next, we've talked a lot about research and how research is done, but we haven't talked much about how that is translated. And that's a um, a large part of Black Dog Institute's uh, great work. Uh, Sarah Holland is our um, Innovation uh, Program Manager at the Black Dog Institute, and she's going to talk about a program called Living With Deadly Thoughts and how that's implemented. Uh, Sarah is responsible for guiding and supporting the development of research and tech that can be translated into products and services to support and improve the lives of people with mental illness. She's got a vast experience uh, in the corporate sector, and I have worked with Sarah on a couple of projects and am always astounded at how smart and fast she moves and how agile everything happens in Sarah's world. I'm really looking forward to this presentation. Would you please welcome to the stage, Sarah Holland. So today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, living with deadly thoughts. We've all heard about the need for innovation and its importance for industry and the economy. Because of this, there's a multitude of definitions around. The one that makes the most sense to me, and I believe supports the Black Dog Institute and our mission, came from a friend, Nathan Baird, who's an experienced leader in the Australian ecosystem. Innovation is something that we do. It's the act of challenging the status quo. It must create new value, and it must satisfy a human need. The challenges that we're facing with mental health today require us to do something different. We need to create new pathways, adopt new delivery methods, and always put the needs of the people that we're solving for first. Over the last five years, I experienced mental health problems in the workplace and within my own family. Mark, a colleague of mine, was a bit older than me in a senior financial role and with a young team of people working under him. He's also one of the funniest men that I've ever had the pleasure of working with. I knew he suffered from anxiety and yet he managed it. His situation started to change, but we were unaware of how bad it actually was for him. Mark started suffering panic attacks 
which to us looked more like an extra dose of sarcasm or an edge to his sometimes cutting sense of humour. He reached a point that, in hindsight, it should never have got to. He ended up taking leave, and we didn't see him for several months. Seeing his deterioration really impacted me. I felt that we didn't have the right understanding of how best to support him, what type of support was available for him whilst at work, and also what the best resources were that we could access. It was around this time that my older brother, at the age of 48, started to become unwell. He is one of the most social, he's, he is one of the most social people in my family. He's always up for a chat and he loves meeting people. Peter has since been diagnosed with severe depression, PTSD, and at this stage is unable to work. His journey to accessing help was very slow. He wasn't coping for a long time before he actually reached breaking point. And with a young family to support, he's in a really devastating place now. Getting access to the right care at the right time is crucial. Even though the Black Dog Institute is recognised as a world leader in the design, the development and the evaluation of e-mental health interventions, we still have much to do in terms of reach and engagement. How can we better integrate these interventions into the broader mental health system? And how can we do a better job of enhancing the quality and experience so that these interventions get the necessary promotion, are acceptable and engaging to use. We're currently working on bringing an online self-help program for suicide prevention to all Australians. Unlike the research programs that you've heard about today, we didn't build this one from scratch. Instead, we've leveraged a program that was developed trialled and found to be successful in showing reductions in suicidal thinking in the Netherlands and most recently Denmark. This is the Living with Deadly Thoughts program. We've identified a real need for this type of program in Australia. For people who might experience suicidal thinking but do not seek help. As an online intervention within existing mental health services, such as the Black Dog Step Care Service, or Lifeline's phone and text-based services, and as a way for those with a history of suicidal thinking to continue to build their skills and learn new things that can be accessed in their own home. We've already undertaken some important activities. Between 2013 and 2016, we conducted a trial to test if the Living With Deadly Thoughts self-help program could be effective. The results showed it was, and there was no deterioration of symptoms within our trial participants. We recognised, however, that there were some improvements required before we could take the program any further. Since that time, we've undertaken a lot of consultation with users and potential partners, and have started a complete redevelopment of the program to increase engagement, to update the technology, the design and the user experience, and to integrate the perspective of our lived, our lived experience community. The regulatory environment around software is also changing. Under the TGA, the Therapeutic, the Therapeutic Goods Administration, software with an intended use as a health-related treatment is being reclassified as a medical device. This means that the development of online programs and apps from the 25th of August this year will need to meet a new set of regulations. We see this as a positive step for our programs and a key differentiator for the Black Dog Institute. There are over 1,400 mental health apps available, and yet we've only found around 73 of them provide some form of evidence. The situation obviously needs to be overhauled. What does all this mean for the Living With Deadly Thoughts program? Well, we still need to finalise our redesign to ensure it's user-friendly, accessible and supports the digital experience that we all naturally expect these days. It's a unique program and nothing like it currently exists in Australia. 
we need to continue strengthening and widening our collaboration activities and our partnerships. Partners that include yourselves, as well as Lifeline, our network of GPs and PHNs, psychologists and other clinicians. Once the program is ready, we'll be conducting an RCT, or a randomised control trial, in the wild. If we can reimagine the journey for Mark and Peter, what would it look like? Through the act of challenging the status quo, we would increase access to and enhance alternative pathways for them to reach help as and when they need it. To create new value, we must keep pushing the boundaries of what technology and tools we have at our disposal to help address one of the most challenging human needs, our mental health and well-being. And at the heart of all this, we'll keep embracing innovation practices like human-centred design so that we put the needs of the people that we're solving for first. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you so much. Uh, I think I can feel the collective sigh in the room uh, because that was our last presenter for today. Thank you so much. Um, folks, I hope you've enjoyed the incredible showcase that you've seen today. Um, you will know that this is a small snippet, a small sample of what, the, what we're doing at Black Dog uh, Institute in terms of research and knowledge translation. Philanthropy and private sector support uh, is crucial, it's fundamental to the way we've been able to operate and scale these programs that you presented today. Um, if there's something that's piqued your interest that you want to like, would like to know more about, then please reach out to Lewis and he will be more than happy to, um, to help you with that. Uh, in the meantime, these are obviously really difficult times uh, throughout Australia and throughout the globe and we um, at Black Dog Institute wish you the very, very best. Um, please visit our website for further information and for further help. Um, let's look after each other in these really tough times and let's make mental health an absolute priority in response to these uh, current world circumstances. Thank you again for joining us today and until next time, go well.